On Wednesday, April the 10th, 1912, in brilliant sunshine, although the day was cold, the unsinkable pride of the White Star Line left Southampton. She was commanded by Captain Smith, Commodore of the White Star Fleet, and this was to be his last appointment before retiring. A crowd had gathered on the pier to watch her leave her moorings. The Titanic was a new breed of luxury liner. The route for this maiden voyage took her to Cherbourg and Queenstown, where she took on emigrants bound for the New World. Among her passengers were many of the wealthy and influential, with, according to one calculation, combined assets of 120 million pounds. There was something about the Titanic that was so very formal. It was so stiff. The atmosphere was stiff. The uh, coziness. Uh, well, you know, the kind of get-together feeling, it didn't exist. I always remember going up on the lift, a little boy said to me, you know, madam, it's quite an honor, I'm only 14 years old, I'm a lift boy. But we were sleeping six in a bunk, and uh, we were treated like as if we were in a third-class restaurant as to go after the food. We were not allowed to go in any part of the ship except the, uh, the deck that we were allowed to go on. It. If you were rich, the decks provided a sumptuous way of life. The band played the gayest tunes and American ragtime dances, and in the splendor of the Café Parisienne, the light melodies of the day. The dining rooms, state rooms, and common rooms were furnished in various periods and styles, so that English gentlemen might sit in rooms panelled and adorned like their own at home and so that those extra good food inches could be counteracted, they even provided a splendidly equipped gymnasium. On Sunday evening, April the 14th, the night of the gala dinner, the band was playing, the millionaires were drinking at the bar, the Titanic was aglow with glittering lights. Then three rings on the bell gave the alarm from the crow's nest, and a shout down the telephone, ice ahead. The time was 11.40. There was a very slight bump. Just a little jar, nothing at all. And I went in my room. There was a second light jar, nothing of consequence. But you knew something had happened, and one man said, look at that, that's an iceberg, and it's a whopper. Because you know, there's one-eighth above the water and seven-eighths below. And this plume and things are all, all the way over the top of the ship. Thought nothing of it. We picked up the bits of ice, and most of us played snowballs. Well, I found a life belt in one of the cabins, the first-class cabins. I put this on, not to, not securely, and I was walking aimlessly on deck, thinking what to do next. And. Uh, Looking over the side, I saw the boats being launched for the uh, survivors, and it was building children on the first side, so I had no chance there. And I was, while I was looking over the, the uh, side of the boat, one of the crew in the lifeboat shouted out to me to jump. Well, I didn't actually jump over the boat, I crawled across the derricks, came down the falls, dropped in the water, and I was picked up by the boat that, that returned and picked me up. A little while later, a man came to my door, his teeth were chattering. He said, Madam, get up, get out. You know, they're making the women and children leave in lifeboats. They say you're coming back for breakfast. You know, these crazy English, they do anything. They make you get up and go off in boats and go off and come back for breakfast. What do you think of that? But before I went, I locked every window in my three staterooms and closed every trunk and locked every trunk and took the keys with me. Nineteen keys for nineteen trunks. I had all my evening slippers, diamond buckles. No, not real diamonds, but diamond. And I had a wool cap and two fox furs and a paper-thin broad-tailed coat and no underwear and no stockings but a pair of velvet slippers and these buckles and i lost a buckle 
And who should I see? Mr. Mock, a miniature painter. And he said, look, it's trouble. I just said, no. Well, he said, you'll have to jump now into the lifeboat. I said, jump? With this thing I've got on? What do you think I am, an acrobat or a monkey or something? I can jump in this thing. Well, he said, you'll have to. My sister's in that lifeboat. Well, I looked at that lifeboat, swinging out on the davits. Oh, possibly, oh, I don't know by measurements, but it was an awful long way. And down below was the sea, 14 stories below. What if you jumped and you fell between? No, I never would have left the ship. But a sailor came along and he said, say you, you don't want to be saved. Well, I'll save your baby. And he grabbed this pig from under my arm and he tossed it in the lifeboat. And I turned to this man, Monk, and I said, that does it. But when they threw that pig, I knew it was my mother calling me. You know, when we look at the figures, there were less people saved from the steerage class. That's right. Than they were from the first right, class. Right, because they were not allowed to go on, on a first class deck. And that was the only way one could be saved? Yes. In the wireless cabin, the two operators, Phillips and Bride, flashed out signals for assistance until the deck was awash. Did the band actually play music while the ship went down? No. Uh, I heard the band play when the boat struck, when I first tried to get on the deck. But when I decided to jump off the boat, I actually saw the band standing about with the instruments. I don't doubt that they were playing music. Other people heard it. But when people say that music played as the ship went down, that is a ghastly, horrible lie. Arthur Lewis, a bedroom steward, was saved because he was detailed to row one of the lifeboats. What were the other passengers like in the lifeboat? Well, they never spoke, you see. There was women and children in the boat all night, but they never spoke. They just sat about, sat back down there waiting to get picked up. But you never talked to each other? No, well, we didn't know one another, so we couldn't get in conversation. And then the horrible fear was in my heart, and I think everybody else's, that the dreadful, dreadful suction that it drawn us towards the Titanic would suck us under the Titanic. At 2.20 a.m. on Monday the 15th of April and two and a half hours after she struck the iceberg, the largest liner afloat slid beneath the black icy waters to the floor of the Atlantic. The Titanic carried a total of 2,206 passengers and crew. 703 people survived. The total loss of life was 1,503.